What was invented in Glasgow that changed the world and then inspired a detail in the Harry Potter movies? Where did a baby go missing for 30 years? And where can you go to find artefacts that are older than Glasgow, older than Scotland, and probably even older than Lulu? But I'll need to check the Lulu thing. Find out now on this episode of Astonishing Glasgow. This whole episode will stay south of the river, and the subjects can all be found on Govan Road. The first astonishing place caught my eye all the way back in 2021 when I was filming episode 2 about the graving docks. There's some good news to share about them while I'm here. They've been performing tests on the site and they tried pumping out Dock 1 to test its structural integrity. The tests were successful and it looks like funding is in place to return it into use as a dry dock for the Queen Mary and for winter birthing the Waverley. As well as this there will be a heritage and community centre. Great news if it protects the existence of the last great piece of shipping heritage this far up the Clyde. Anyway, that's not what this episode is about. Go back to episode 2 when you get to the end of this one if you want to know more about the graving docks. A stone's throw away from the dock is this red sandstone tenement. At first glance, it looks a lot like most of Glasgow's red sandstone tenements, but look closer and there are some very interesting features. They are now flats or apartments for our foreign friends, but the building was never designed for people to live in. Built in 1890, this building was purpose built by John Cossar as the headquarters and print works of the Govan Press newspaper. John Cossar started in business in 1870 and was the inventor of a folding and pasting machine. But only six months after this building was complete, John Cossar died aged 49 and control passed to his wife Jane. She very successfully ran the printing business and by 1891 she had added newspaper titles, the Clydebank Press and the Renfrew Press to their existing newspapers of the Govan Press and the Southern Press. Lots of use of the word press and for very good reason. John and Jane's son Thomas Cossar had returned to the business after training as an engineer in the local shipyards. In the 1890s Thomas would wait for the last print run of the week to be completed then dismantled the existing Wharfdale printer press to try out his improvements and by 1899 he had filed patents for a brand new form of printing press. His machine could print from a roll of paper rather than one sheet at a time, meaning it could print four to 5,000 sheets of paper in an hour. This was revolutionary at the time. He also designed it to be compact and easily transported and the very first Cossar Press was shipped to New Zealand in 1903. In 1915, a new and improved model was produced and sold worldwide. From Bombay to Beirut, newspapers went into print using the Cossar Press and its compact design meant that local newspapers could afford to print their very own editions. The last surviving Cossar Press was installed in Creef in 1907 and only stopped printing the Strathairn Herald on the 28th of March 1991. The last of its kind, it had to be dismantled to get out of its purpose-built print work in Creef. It was then donated to the National Museum of Scotland. It was reassembled temporarily in Govan less than a mile from the Govan Press building where it had been invented, before it was then transported to the National Museum's Collection Centre in Edinburgh. A print revolution, and it all started right here at the back of 577 Govan Road. The print works at the rear have long been demolished, but the office building survives. 
Jane Cossar died in 1926, aged 83. It's Jane and John that can be seen front and centre on the building. They are joined by Johannes Gutenberg, credited with bringing the movable type printer to Europe in the 1400s, though ironically his name is misspelt with too many T's. An important lesson for printers, to dot your T's and cross your I's. The Scottish authors, Sir Walter Scott and Robert Burns, along with William Caxton who introduced the printing press to Britain in 1476, complete the line-up on the façade. The only part of the story left to tell is the Hollywood connection. When making the film Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, the inspiration for the Coxford Reliant, the press used to print the Quibbler magazine, was taken directly from Thomas Cossar's flatbed printing press. I mean, it's not exactly the same, but there are some similarities. It's time to move on. From the Govan Press, we are heading for Govan Cross and an old friend. Remember Mary Barber? She featured in episode 22. And hands up who's been a subscriber since then. Thanks Mary. And thanks to everybody else who has hit that subscribe button. And to everybody who hasn't, what are you waiting for? It's not Mary we're here to visit today. But the next astonishing story is right across the road. This is the Aitken Memorial Drinking Fountain. Cast iron drinking fountains could at one point be found on almost every town square in Scotland, so Govan was not unusual in that respect, but this one has more of a story to tell than most, and it starts with the man who gave it its name. John Aitken was born in Govan on the 15th of June 1838. In 1859, he opened a chemist shop very close to the Govan Press building we just came from, but his building is no longer there. By the time he was 21, he was studying medicine under the famous Dr Lister at Glasgow University, and when he graduated, he returned to Govan and opened his own surgery. He was a popular doctor, and when Govan became a borough in 1864, Dr John Aitken was appointed by the commissioners as the chief medical officer and police surgeon, as well as running his own surgery for the people of Govan. He watched Govan grow from around 8,000 residents in 1864 to over 46,000 residents in 1880. He campaigned vigorously to reduce the high mortality rate from respiratory diseases in the poor which were the highest in children under five years old. His practice covered Govan as well as Dromoyne and the collieries of Ibrooks, but by 1880, Dr John Aitken would himself become a victim of ill health. He died on the 11th of March 1880 of bronchial pneumonia, but many believed at the time that he had worked himself to death caring for his patients. Almost immediately after his death, a committee was formed to raise money by public subscription for a fitting memorial and the Aitken Memorial Fountain was unveiled here on the 3rd of May 1884. The only known fountain of this type to be cast by Cruikshanks and Co of Denny, it has stood here watching Govan's transformation from a centre of world shipbuilding and industry to a district of the city of Glasgow. Around the top of the fountain there are six plaques representing lodges and societies who helped to fund the fountain. But make no mistake, the people of Govan gave what they could and at the unveiling ceremony it was said that the poor never wanted a physician or surgeon without fee or reward as long as he lived among them. The fountain has stood here for almost 150 years and much like Govan itself, it has made it through some tough times. By the turn of the century, that's the turn of the 21st century for those that feel really old, the fountain was in a bad way. The paint was flaking, some of the castings had rusted through, and most notably of all, the baby had gone missing, 
last seen in the 1980s before being broken off. Thankfully funding was approved for the fountain's restoration and because it is category B listed, it was all done with the supervision of Historic Scotland. Analysis would find 33 layers of paint, but many of the cast iron parts were broken, rusted or missing, and as many parts were one-off castings, it took a lot to get it looking as fantastic as it does today. The baby, or boy with a paddle, was designed specifically for the fountain, although it was similar to others found on fountains throughout Scotland. It was to be a challenge to reproduce, but luck would play a huge part. After a story about the fountain's restoration appeared in the Glasgow Evening Times, the restoration team received a phone call from a Mr Hugh Kinnaird. When he read the story and saw the pictures, he realised that something looked very familiar. It just so happened that the missing baby was in his back garden, next to his pond. He had bought the piece 16 years earlier from an architectural salvage business, and although he had moved house several times, he had always taken the baby with him. Mr Kinnaird was delighted to reunite the baby with the fountain, and donated it back to the people of Govan so that it could be returned to its rightful place. The freshly restored fountain was returned to its original location in 2010. It can now watch Govan's continuing regeneration and you will soon walk right past it as you cross the brand new £30 million footbridge being built from the Riverside Museum to Govan. It is due to be finished by the end of 2023 and as you cross it, remember to think of Dr John Aitken and what he did for the people of Govan. It's time to head to the final destination of this video, but on the way, we need to stop and say hello to this guy. This is Sir William Pierce, born in Chatham, Kent in 1833. He eventually became the owner of Fairfield Shipyard in Glasgow and a Member of Parliament for Govan before his death in 1888. His story and legacy in the city is enough that it may make a larger episode, so stay tuned for that in the future. But one of his gifts to the people of Govan is the Pierce Institute, which he stands right outside of. Built as a public hall, a library and meeting rooms, it still serves the same purpose 115 years later. In the last part of this video, I'm back to talking about stones and bones, with a wander around yet another graveyard. To the left of the Pierce Institute is a narrow, cobbled avenue, which leads to the place that existed before Glasgow was Glasgow, and even before Scotland was Scotland. There has been a graveyard and church on this site for at least 1500 years and it is believed to be the oldest surviving churchyard in the whole of Scotland. It's not the original church, there have been at least five others before the current church was completed in 1888. The land is thought to have been used by ancient kings of Strathclyde as a place for royal ceremonies and public gatherings. Archaeologists have found traces of a processional route heading a hundred metres east to where there was once a massive artificial mound called Doomster Hill. Doomster Hill was lost as Govan grew, but was roughly on the site of the new flats beside the Aitken Fountain. It is nothing short of a miracle that the graveyard survived the Industrial Revolution, with Harland and Wolfe's shipyard looming over it, but we should be very thankful that it did. As if the story isn't astonishing enough, it's what's inside the church that will really amaze you. The church houses a collection of internationally significant medieval stone carvings, known as the Govan Stones. All the stones in the collection came from the churchyard and were moved inside around 100 years ago, after spending over a thousand years open to the elements. The stones on display in the church are all intricately carved, but nobody really knows the meaning of the carvings, 
So come along and see them for yourself and make up your own mind. The real star of the collection are these five hogback stones. Dating back to the 9th century, these stones were carved by Viking settlers and give a clue to just how important this site was. There is nowhere else with hogback stones this big and to have five in the same location is unheard of. Govan was the London or New York of the 9th century and was not only being visited by traders, it was attracting kings and queens. Thought to be the last resting place of a royal saint of the Kingdom of Strathclyde, this heavily carved sarcophagus was discovered buried in the graveyard in 1855 and when its significance was realised, it and the stones were brought inside for safekeeping. The stones and the museum are well worth a visit, and let's face it, an internationally important collection of ancient carved stones only 20 minutes from George Square is an astonishing asset to Glasgow. There are loads more stones than I can show you in this video, so you're going to have to go along and see them for yourself. It's free to enter, and the volunteer guides are superb but double check the opening times on the link to the Govanstones website in my description. If you can afford it, remember to leave a wee donation in the collection box when you visit. I'm sure it will be much appreciated. I visited by bike, but there is parking nearby, the subway is only a three minute walk away, and soon you will be able to follow the route of the ancient Vikings as the footbridge over the Clyde from the Riverside Museum is in roughly the same location as the ford in the river that made Govan's location so important. So there you go, some more astonishing stories of the people and the places in our great city. If you've enjoyed this episode, please remember to hit the thumbs up button below. If you didn't already, please hit that subscribe button to be notified when the next episode is uploaded. If you want to help me make more of these episodes, please leave a small donation via the Super Thanks button, and you can get in touch through the comments section or via Facebook and Instagram, all the links are in the description below. Thank you very much for watching, and see you next time in Astonishing Glasgow. Right. I'm away for a poke of chips, and I suppose I better write Lulu an apology letter. See ya. <laughs>